in, we learned in chapter 1 that God created uh, both uh, male and female. He created them. And when he created both male and female, he had a grand design in mind. And what's interesting, uh, all of us um, are individuals. We didn't come out in groups, and we uh, were born, and we start life, and we really end up having to only spin one plate, and that's our life. And, and even spinning one plate seems complicated at times, does it not? And then all of a sudden, uh, we start to mingle with, uh, with the others, and we find God's man, God's woman, and we, we eventually get married. So now uh, the two become one flesh. We'll learn about this in the coming weeks. And now you got a marriage, and now you, you have two people trying to spin, the, uh, spin these two plates, and things get uh, even more and more complicated. Uh, what you don't realize, and nobody tells you after you get married, that all of a sudden you are introduced to this thing called bills. And bills come along, and I don't mean that as a person. I mean that as bills. And uh, all of a sudden now that's placed onto your plate, if I could say it that way, and yeah, the, the spinning of plates gets more and more complicated because now you have bills. So because you have bills, you have to introduce yourself to a thing called a job. And so all of a sudden you have this plate uh, called a job, and now that's placed on your plates, and now the two of you are trying to spin this, and it's getting even more complicated to keep the plates spinning and not to flip over. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you have one of these, a kid, <laughs> Right? And now you add that on top of everything else, and it really doesn't fit well even. And, 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 and now you're, you're, spinning, you're spinning all these plates, and, and before you know it, you don't even know really at the time how it happens, but you, you ac actually have a lot of kids, <laughs> and, and, and you add those to your plates, and now, now after nine kids, you figure out how to stop it, and, 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 and now you're trying to spin all of these plates, and over time... All these plates, all of a sudden, this, this shows up in your life uh, right here. It's a teenager. And, 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 and you look at this teenager, it thinks it's a plate, but it's really not even a plate. And, and, and you don't know whether to serve from it or to eat off of it. It just kind of sits there and dominates the whole family. And, and life gets really complicated really fast as we're all trying to spin these plates and you're, at some point in time, you're wondering, does anybody have directions for all of this? Because it's really, really complicated, and it's really, really hard to figure out at times. Well, the great news, the good news, the grand news is the fact that there is directions, and there are instructions. And we're coming to a, what I would say is a mini-series within a series we're in the series called Origins, but as we come to chapter 2 now, we're going to start a three-part series on, on this thing called family and marriage, a godly man and a godly woman, what all those, what all those are about. Because I believe we live in such a time as this, I really do, that hunting season is open on men and women and marriage. And every one that represents any of those three categories, which is 100% participation here this morning, all of us have targets on our back. And we have drifted uh, out of the harbor of life into uh, what we'd say is somehow suppressed or controlled chaos is really what it is. And, and so the goal of this series isn't just to control chaos. The, the goal is to figure out how to thrive inside this grand design that God has given to us. I don't want to go into uh, what does it mean to have a traditional role as a man, tra traditional role as a woman, traditional role in marriage. I, I don't want traditional roles. I, I don't even want cultural ro roles. I want to think biblically. I want us to wipe the slate clean for a few weeks and just come back to these instructions afresh and to think biblically what this looks like. We have uh, attacks on both ends, both extremes coming after men, women, and marriage. We have, we have misogyny, which is uh, wreaking havoc on our culture these days. And, and then you have this uh, feminism, this extreme feminism over here. And both of them, both of them, if I could say this and be as blunt as I can be, is both of them are unbiblical, very unbiblical. And, and I understand at the end of this series, 
Uh, many of you will think, well, his last name must be Cleaver because, wow, <laughs> take me back to the DeLorean, Marty, because this is way ancient. No, I don't want to get ancient. I don't want traditional. I want biblical. And so I want us to uh, focus on that, and I want us to think, what is God's design? And, and you, you, may, you may wrestle with it. I get that. But I will tell you this as a, as a preacher up here. I will never... I will never apologize for a message from the king. Amen. Never. Now, in, in that being said, which I love you guys, third service, you're a clapping service. The other two services, pff, nothing. And, um, and, and let me just say this, this is a commercial. Be thankful you're at 11 o'clock this morning. Uh, if you came to 8 o'clock, it was a total disaster. I preached a horrible sermon. I mean, a horrible sermon. <laughs> And, and uh, people often say to me, Todd, isn't it fun to be able to preach three times? It is until you have a horrible sermon. And then you've got to preach it three times. So I, I tried to clean it up second. I'm going to try to clean it up a little more. But praise the Lord, you're not at 8 o'clock. Okay? Now, I say that. Don't come up to me afterwards and say, that was the greatest sermon, Pastor. Liar. Okay? So, so, so don't, do, don't, 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 don't go there. Okay? This morning, though, I do want us to look at the Scriptures. And I want us to see a fresh... See afresh what God's design is. And like I said, not everybody's going to applaud. But again, if, if I wanted to applause, I'd go into the circus. And, and the reality is, I want us to teach our boys, I want us to teach our, our girls, what does it look like to be a man of God and a woman of God? And, 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 and let's chase after what's biblical. And so this morning, if I can, I'm going to read our passage for us, and then we're going to we're going to dive right in. And so let your eyes drop down to verse 4 of chapter 2, and we're going to pick up right here at the beginning. Verse 4, here's how Moses records it. He says, these are the generations. These are the generations. Now stop there for a moment, just a commentary. Uh, generations is a big deal in Genesis. In fact, for uh, 10 times in the book of Genesis, we have this uh, statement of generations. Why is that? It's because we're looking at historical narrative. This is in the letter of Paul. This is historical narrative. And God is trying to explain to us how everything began. And he's going in chronological order. He went down the six days of creation, and now he's going to explain step by step by step how did all of what we experience today come to be. So notice verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Stop there for a moment. What you're going to see here now in chapter 2 is basically kind of a drill down, microscope, telescope, looking deeply at what has happened in chapter 1. Chapter 1 was a cursory, uh, cursory uh, overview of, of, of creation of everything, uh, heavens, earth, man, and everything. Now chapter 2 starts to drill down to how was man created, how was woman created, what is marriage, and all of a sudden we see a, a broadening of, of understanding from Moses on what, what actually took took place in chapter 1 when God created man and woman. Notice, notice what it says, verse 5. When, there was, when no uh, bush of the field was yet in the land, and no splant, uh, splant, no, splant no, no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Stop there at verse 6. You say, well, wait a minute, God already created the, all the trees and the plants. But notice this, these are Hebrew words that describe something else than a garden. There's no bush of the field, all right, and, and, and there's no small plant that had sprung up. That's thorns and thistles, okay? There's no, there's no small plant that sprung up, meaning no weeds in the garden, no sin. There's no fall in chapter 3. So before, before we see the fall in chapter 3, we, 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 see, we see the fact that all of what God created was absolutely perfect. No, no weeds in the garden. Can I get a loud amen for no weeds in the garden? I want to go back to the garden as quick as possible, right? No weeds in the garden. So we move on, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. 
The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 10, now he gives us kind of, um, he map quests this out for us. And he says, a river flowed out of Eden to the water, to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. Stop there for a moment. Where's Eden? With the best understanding uh, today is modern day Iraq. I know you're thinking, really, the Garden of Eden? Remember, pre, pre-fall, uh, pre-flood, uh, uh, before the, before the uh, flood, there's no deserts. It's just lush, lush land. And he says, I'll tell you, I'm going to give you some point markers to kind of orient yourself. And he gives us really four rivers. Two of the rivers we actually know about today. The other two rivers we don't know about. Uh, some people try to guess, and they guess really poorly at it, okay? And the reason I don't think we know what they are is because this is before the flood. And when we get to the flood, you're going to see that God radically changed the face of this planet. And, and it'd be very easy to see how rivers changed or went away or actually started. I mean, crazy things happened right there at the flood. So notice, notice he goes on, he explains, now out of, these, out of this one river, there's four divides or four headwaters, if you will. Uh, verse 11, the name of the first is the Pishon. We don't know what that one is. Uh, the, uh, he, he says, it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where, the, where there is gold. That's awesome, right? Uh, not only a beautiful garden, but you've got all these, all these uh, uh, minerals and, and, and you've got gold there. I mean, it's this crazy, crazy garden. And, and the gold of that land is good. And, and bedelium and onyx stones are there. I mean, it's a beautiful garden. Both, it just kind of sparkled. It glimmered, if you will. Um, verse 13, the, the name of the second river is Gihon. Uh, we don't know what that river is either. Some people, again, try to isolate it and identify it, but I don't think you can. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris. We know that river today, which flows uh, east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the uh, Euphrates River. We know, we know the history of the Euphrates River. Verse 15 now, the Lord God took the man grabs the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And we'll stop there for just this morning's reading. What we have here is the introduction of man. And I don't say mankind, but actually man. He introduces us to, to, the, to the, the, the idea that God created a special creation, just as he will do in the, with the woman here in, at the next part. But in this moment, right here, right now, is he forms and he fashions this man. Now, here's the deal. We're going to talk about uh, in this series, you'll see up on the screen, today is let men be men, all right? Let men be men. The next part, part two, is going to be let women be women. Let women be women, and then go out on a limb, see if you can guess number three, let marriage be marriage. And, and so here's what I want to do. I want to encourage us with the Word of God. I don't want to berate the men and the women in this room. We get enough of that. I want to encourage us with God's plan and God's grand design of men and women and marriage, because it's a beautiful design. Uh, it's not easy after the fall, but it's a grand design of his. So let men be men. Do I have any men in this room? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, do we have any men in this room? Yeah, Yeah, there we go. Get some testosterone flowing. So here's the deal. We we want to talk about what does it mean to be a biblical man? And I believe from this passage, because I'm not going to do a comprehensive study on biblical manhood here, because I could end up with like 75 points of what does it mean to be, biblical, to be a biblical man. I want to exegete just this text and pull out from it what Moses records by the inspiration of the Spirit of God of things, of really three things, if I could say it this way, three things that are just absolutely foundational for what it means to be a biblical man. What does it look like? What, is, what, what, is it, what, what does it mean to be a godly man? And I, I'm going I'm, I'm to encourage us men. I'm not going to beat you up with this. Ladies, I just want to encourage you to encourage the men in these three things. I, I know all of us tend to look for perfection. I'm going to encourage you this morning to look for progression. 
okay? Perfection. We already know, we already know that every man in this room is not perfect. What we want to do is cheer them on to progression, to being conformed more to the image of Christ than they were yesterday. So we want to celebrate that, all right? So young men in this room, this is who you want to be, and this is what's going to attract a woman uh, to come into your garden someday, all right? And, and, and then ladies, if you're single and, 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 and you're, you're, you're still looking, this is the template, okay? And if, if you're dating a guy with, with, his name starts with an L, loser, then here's, here's what you do, is he's a loser because he doesn't even meet the threshold of these three foundational truths of what it means to be a man. And so if at the end of this message, you realize you've got a loser on your hand, you text him today, over, and it's done, all right? And, and, and you just, you drop him like a used Kleenex and you move on, all right? I want us, can I get an amen here? I want us to talk about biblical manhood here, all right? So we all have, we all have kind of, a, we all have a, a dog in the race here. We're all chasing something here. The first thing, and I'm going to give you three words, and these words are worth writing down in your Bible or in a note card to keep in your Bible because they're so foundational, so essential. Uh, and, and the first word is the word created. And the passage I wrote to you this morning is, is Moses records in detail how did man actually get uh, to be? How was man created? And in verse 7, he tells us exactly what happened in chapter 1. He says this, Then the Lord God formed. Did you catch that? The Lord God formed the man, the man of dust from the ground. Why are men always dirty? Because we were formed from the dirt. We got dirt all over us, right? That's where we came from. The Lord, Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground. What does he do? He picks up a handful of mud and he, out of this, he, he forms and he fashions this man. And notice this, what does he do next? After he has this body, this, this person is not a person yet until this happens. And breathe, everybody say breathe. breathe. He breathed into his nostrils. <laughs> Can I just say awesome? I mean, that's awesome to think about this. God Almighty breathes into the nostrils of, of this man. We know what his name is. His name comes from the Hebrew. The Hebrew word for man is Adam. Go out on a limb. What do you think his name is? Adam. So we have him bearing the very name of who he is. He's a man, and his name is Adam. And he breathes, he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man, the Adam, becomes, watch this, cray-cray time, becomes a living creature. Well, let me just let me make a bold statement to every man in this room. You, men in this room, you are a creation of God Almighty. That's who you are. You're not a punching bag, and you're not a joke. Every TV sitcom, the, the bozo on TV is always the men in the sitcom. Let me just tell you, men, what you are is not only image bearers, but you are actually formed and fashioned by God himself. And God, in a very personal, in a very intimate way, in a very awesome way, grabs this Adam by the shirt collar, pulls him up to God's face, and God literally blows in, breathes into what the Hebrews call the ruha of life, the spirit of life. And the moment he breathes into this man, the heart starts pumping. The metabolic system starts functioning. The lungs fill, the blood circulating, the synapses are firing, and he becomes this living creature. And it's awesome on this day because this living creature is standing in perfection face to face with a perfect holy God. How awesome is that? This, this word form, circle in your Bible, is a very significant word. It's not to build. It's not like he, he's, he says, let me get some material. I'm going to try to manufacture this. No, the word in the Hebrew, let me just tell you, the word in the Hebrew, because there is a word in Hebrew to describe this kind of manufacturing kind of construction. That's not the word that's used. The Hebrew word here that we translate formed is this idea of an intimate intimate personal knowledge and love towards whatever is being created. This is God himself saying, man was created, Adam was created, in not, in, not just from my hands, but was created from my heart and my mind. I, I breathed the life into him. 
He forms and fashions the man. This is a great uh, proof text for what is the definition of life. You have Adam who's been formed out of the dust, so he's just a body. And it wasn't until God breathed the Ruha, the spirit of life, into him. What's the definition of life? It is spirit and body together. What's the definition of death? It is when spirit and body are separated. How do we know that? Look at the life of Jesus on the cross. When he breathed his last, remember what happened. He gave up his spirit. His spirit went to be with the Father, but his body hung on the cross. When body and spirit are separated, that's the definition of death. That's the definition of death. And let me just tell you something. Remember, Adam is created in perfection here. He's created in perfection. And he's a living creature. And I will tell you this this morning. The reason reason death is so painful. As a pastor in ministry, I spent a lot of time with dying people. And I'll tell you why, when when someone dies, it rips your guts out. And the reason is, is that we were never created to die. People say death is natural. Death is not natural. Death is a curse. What's natural is to live. And all of a sudden, Adam becomes this living creature, and he has life, and his heart is beating. He's got skin and muscle and bones. And he's formed in fashion, much like a potter does with clay. Men, let me just tell you something straight up. You are not a prototype. Our culture today says, oh, yeah, God created man first just to get all the, uh, all the mistakes out of the way so that he could create perfection. <laughs> okay, we're not at a woman's conference. You're not all snowflakes, all right? So here's the deal <laughs> is, no, man, you, weren't, you, you were created first because God has a grand design in, in mind, not because he wanted to work out the kinks and then make uh, prototype number two. You're, you're, men, you are not as dumb as a rock as they tell you on TV. We, we must say, hey, men, we must take our, our identity cues, not from culture, but from Christ. And I've said this a billion times, but I'll say it again to the men in this room. You were created in the image of God. You were formed in the heart of God. And what dangles from every Christ follower man in this room is a price tag. And on it, it says, one Jesus Christ. That is your worth. That is your identity. Don't let the TV tell you you're some dumb moron. God has created you in his heart. He has a plan and a purpose for you. God, let me just say this, God, you are God-built, men. Can I get an amen? amen. You are God-built. That's who you are. And, that, and, and, and we have to remember this because we, otherwise we, we drift into the cultural thinking of this is what a man is or this is what a man is. Let me tell you, extreme living is never good on either side. We, we, we even in the church tend to think that men are, are defined by a certain number of adjectives because all men must fit this category. And remember, I don't want traditional manhood here. I want biblical manhood to be lifted up. Traditional manhood says, hey, here's the list what describes a man. You'll see it up on the screen. And what you see up on the screen is the traditional list. Men are aggressive, they're strong, they're rough, decisive, brash, loud, and blunt. I should have said smelly too, but, but, but that's, what, that's what we think. That's what a man is. The man is, is aggressive and is strong. He's got hair all over his body. Gross. And so, so <laughs> let me just tell you, no, hey, none of those words make you a man. None of those words do. Why? I'll show you another list of what describes a man. You'll see it up on the screen. A man can be tentative. A man could be weak, could be soft, inquisitive, gentle, quiet, reserved. Those, those it's, adjectives don't define you. The word of God defines you. And when he created man, he created him in God's image. And, and, and understand something, understand something. We are bombarded with this prototype of what the culture thinks, what our family de- demands, what our coworkers want us to be, what our, our bosses are demanding us to be. And, and we're defined by that instead of coming back to biblical manhood and what has God designed here. And, and understand this, ladies in this room, let me just tell you something. And, 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 and guys, one of the attributes of men tend to be prideful, and we're afraid to tell you this because it sounds weak. Because of the fall, ladies, 
Men are tr- tremendously insecure. I know, I know that, I know you go, well, wait a minute. No, I thought women are so, uh, feel like they're insecure. Let me tell you, men are tremendously insecure because one of two things happens. We either see biblical manhood and it causes us to rise to the occasion or we see biblical manhood and it causes us to go, I can never be like that. I'll never, I'll never be able to be like so-and-so. I could never live out that biblical mandate. I just give up. And I'll tell you, ladies, you may be um, dating, you may be married to, you may be raising, you may be friends of or co-worker of a man who has this hard shell on the outside. But I'll tell you from this pulpit, he's a marshmallow on the inside. We just don't, we just don't always open up and say that. We're still like the first Adam that tends to cover ourselves with with leaves. And so men, this morning I want you to understand something is that we, we all get this and we want to encourage each other that, that you can progress. Perfection on this planet, not a chance. But progression to the image of Christ, yes you can. And we want to be your cheerleaders. Ladies, you need to cheer your, your man on. You need, you, 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 he doesn't need to know the seven things he's messing up on. He already knows that. Tell him the one thing that he's just killing it that day. And if you can't think of one thing, pray hard. <laughs> Look in the dictionary for a word. And then praise him for that. Boy, you wash your hands so well. You remember, I can prove, you say, Todd, this sounds like a, a psychobabble. No, I can prove this to you biblically. You know why? Because I go to Ephesians 5 when Paul wrote the treatise on marriage and he wrote the treatise on man, being a man and a woman. And remember, he writes all about marriage. And then he gets to verse 33 of chapter 5 and he says, let me just bottom line this. Bottom line this. And he says, I'm going to tell you the two basic needs of both a man and a woman. And he says to the men, here's the deal. You need to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Why? Because her deepest need is to be loved unconditionally. And then he he looks at the wife and he says, wives, you, you need to respect your husbands. Why? Because his deepest need is respect. He's a marshmallow on the inside. The fall has messed him up and he feels like he can't live to perfection and therefore he lives in a zip code called discouragement. And he doesn't say in this passage, uh, uh, husbands, love your wives if she's lovable, and wives, respect your husbands if he's respectable. These These are commands of unconditional choice, willful decision of each of us. We were created, we were fashioned and formed by God, that's who we are. Number two, write this down, this word calling, calling. This is so foundational, so foundational. In fact, you've heard this maybe a billion times if you've been in the church, but man, I'm just telling you, we're losing it in the church. We're losing this. This whole idea of biblical manhood has a calling on his life. Where do I even get that from the passage? Well, I showed you two verses here, verse 8 and verse 15. Notice what God does with Adam. The Lord God planted a garden, verse 8, in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Drop down to verse 15. Notice what he says again. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. Why? To work it and to keep it. You understand something? In the Bible, it says Adam was put somewhere. Adam had a calling on his life. Adam had a a purpose in his life. He had, to be, he had to be placed somewhere, and he was placed somewhere by the mind, the heart, and the hand of God. He was, he was probably created somewhere. He was probably created somewhere in the West, and, and, and then he was just, he was, he was taken and put in the Garden of Eden. Why? It says right there, verse 15, to work it and to keep it. Well, wait a minute. There's no fall. There's no th- thorns or thistles. You're right. It's the work and to keep it because of the abundance of it. I mean, the, the orange trees were just going crazy. 
just producing fruit. I mean, it's just the abundance of just stewarding all of God's blessing, all of God's goodness. He doesn't just put them on planet Earth to play Xbox. He puts them there with a purpose. He puts them there with a calling. Hey, every man in this room, let me just tell you something. This isn't just an Adam thing. This is a man thing that God has a calling on your life. Adam would have been lost without God if God didn't plant him and put him into his calling. Diedrich Bonhoeffer said, said it this way. I love how he says this. He says, Adam speaks and walks with God as if they belong to each other. Would it be great to be remembered as a man or a woman who speaks and walks with God as though you belonged with him? That's a great word. So Adam is not only created by God, God breathes in life to him. God picks him up and he plants him somewhere. Let me ask you this question, man. Where have you been put? God put Adam somewhere. And God wants to put you somewhere. God has a calling on your life. Yes, he does. You may be sitting here going, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't have a calling, I have a career. Let me just tell you something. The worst thing you can do in life is settle for a career. That's so hourly. You don't, don't do this life and settle for a career. Settle for a, a calling of God. You may say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Todd. <laughs> you know, you pastors, you work one day a week. You're the ones that are called. Now, let me just tell you something. We have a misunderstanding. Every Christ follower has a calling on their life. Every Christ follower is in ministry, 24-7, 365, and God has put a calling on your life. We have to figure out and find out where we've been placed, where we have been put, and chase after that calling of God himself. Man, that's where you thrive. I, I mean, let me tell you, we say, well, no, no, ministry is how you glorify God. No, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. Mowing lawns can be all to the glory of God. Pressing shirts at a dry cleaner can be all to the glory of God. Being in IT can be all to the glory of God because it's Jesus Christ, our Lord, whom we serve. You say, oh, it's so mon- it's, it's tomorrow's Monday. You don't have a Monday. You don't have a Monday either. You have a calling. You have a calling on your life. No wonder Monday comes quick. Why? Because you've got business to do. You, you turn your, watch this, you turn your paycheck into a pulpit and you got a ministry. I miss being in secular business. I love being in secular business. It wasn't like I hated that, so I only have to work a day, so I'll just go do this job. I love that job. I love being with non-believers. I love hearing four-letter words. I do, not because I love the four-letter words, but it's like game on. It's gospel work. I have to share the gospel with people all the time. I work at a church. You know how many times I've shared the gospel with Greg? (laughs) The dude's like almost saved. I mean, it's crazy. (laughs) How boring. I'd much rather spend my day with a bunch of pagans. Why? Because that's a... (laughs) you got a calling. Man, you've heard this before, so I'm going to say it again. Adam was put somewhere, and God asked Adam to do something, and that was this. Reject passivity and accept responsibility. Did you hear that? A man of God is put somewhere to reject passivity and accept responsibility. So we have this whole idea that God created us. And again, I don't want you to look at that as as this ex nihilo. He just kind of spoke us into existence. It's no big deal. No, God breathed the ruha of life into us. He formed and fashioned us in his heart and mind. Then God has put a call on this man called Adam to work and to keep the garden. Not to go pastor a church not to go write a Christian book, to go and work and keep the garden. The call of God came down. And then lastly, lastly, is the word conviction. It's conviction. 
believe it or not, this is where I get fired up. Is the word conviction. Where do, where do I get that? 16 and 17, drill down on it. The Lord, and the Lord God commanded the man. And the Lord God commanded. A command from Elohim. A command from the Godhead. Let me ask you a question. Is that of little importance or of big importance? Big. One more try. Little or big? Big. big. It is muy, muy importante. Very, very, very important. When the Godhead commands you, you should listen up. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. What a blessing. Oh, the provision was everywhere. The permission was everywhere. Provision, permission, you can eat of every tree in the garden. Verse 17, but, here's the command, but of the tree of the knowledge of good, and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely, what? Die. Now, he doesn't mean that you, you, take a, you, take a, you take a bite out of that fruit and you just drop dead. It could have been. Adam probably didn't even know at the time. But what happened is we know what happened. The fall of man, Sinner, sin entered the bloodstream of humanity. And, and he says, I want to give you a command. You can eat of everything. And you, you've experienced good. You live in good. You live in perfect. I mean, you, Adam was the only person that actually lived in Awesome Town. He lived there. Perfection. He understood good. But he says, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good, which you have, and evil. Now, notice, notice this, is, this is God giving permission here. Have you ever asked yourself, I've asked it many times, why in the world did God give Man, the chance to sin. Why didn't he not? Why didn't he just kind of take that off the table? And just why? Why did? Why did? Why is there evil? Why is there sin? I'll tell you why. It's real simple. Because God is love. First John four eight. It's, uh, John says a very significant statement in three words. God is love. God doesn't act loving. He is love. Everything he does comes out of his character, which is love. So whether it be justice, wrath. Mercy, kindness, it's all out of his love. That's, that's his character, that's his nature. It's, it's the highest ethic of God because it, does, it describes his nature. And understand something, and I think you'll get this in marriage. The reality is this, for there to be real love, there has to be freedom to choose. There has to be freedom to choose, otherwise it's not real love. If I told Stacy, I'm gonna love you because I have to. I'm legally bound to you, and that minister said I needed to. Would she feel the warm fuzzies in her heart? <laughs> no. I'm telling you, she didn't when I told her that. <laughs> she really didn't. Why? Because that's, that's, that's not love. So what did God do? God says, I'm going to love you because I am love. And I want you to understand what love is. Love is freedom to choose. I'm going to give you a command and you're going to have a choice whether you follow it or not because that's the nature of who God is. So all of a sudden he has a choice, he has an opportunity to sin and we know what will happen in this. God says, you'll demonstrate your love for me by the choices and here's the word, you ready? You still with me people? Yes. You thinking about lunch? No. <laughs> you liars, I've been, I've been in that side much longer than this side, I'm thinking about lunch even on this side. Um, the word is, here's the word, the word is convictions. Men, we need to teach our boys convictions. What we have is a, uh, a world littered with opinions. Do you not know, understand that we live in a day where everybody is an op-ed writer? You want to look at opinions, just click on Facebook. Everybody has one. It's like a face. Everybody has one. I don't want to raise a boy of opinions. I want to raise a boy of convictions. I want, I, want, I want us to crave, listen, I want us men to crave for passionate convictions, not pointless opinions. 
Men of God, hear me out. I want to cheer you on. I'm not capping on you. I'm not telling you you're not doing this. I just want to cheer you on to keep doing what you're doing. I know you're not perfect, but I want to tell you you're progressing. You got this. You can do this. You, you can have convictions. There are certain things that you just say no to. You just, you just absolutely say, no, I don't go there. I don't do that because not of an opinion, but because of a conviction. There are some things in this world that you die for. I don't mean you die on every hill because that just means you're dead. I'm talking about certain things that you don't give an inch. You, you, you don't give half an inch. You don't give an eighth or a sixteenth to it. You just have convictions about this that, man, I'm going to aim for that. I'm going to stand for that. I'm going, I'm going to live for that. I'm going to sacrifice for that. I'm going to die for that. And that's, that's a conviction, not an opinion, because the Lord God commanded me to do this. Man, if we have those type of men, those type of men, and we do at this church, and we, we proliferate these type of men that stand for convictions, crazy things can happen. It was John Wesley, the great preacher, both in England and America. His brother was Charles Wesley that wrote all the hymns. Imagine their mom, bumper sticker, I have the Wesley brothers. It's amazing. <laughs> And remember, remember the words of John Wesley. When England was upside down, he said these words, give me a dozen men who fear nothing but God, hate nothing but sin, and I will give you England. Crossroads, I tell you this morning, give me a dozen men in this room who fear nothing but God and hate nothing but sin, and I will deliver America to you. I absolutely believe this. Our world is craving for men of convictions. Remember the brave heart, heart, brave heart moment with Joshua and Joshua 24? Finally, going to get into the land, and he gives this speech. It wasn't Mel Gibson. It was Joshua. And, and he, says, he says, what are you going to do? Are you going to go back? Go back to our forefather's place and worship and serve those gods? Or are you going to come into the land with me and serve, serve Jehovah? You need to make a choice. And then remember, remember what he says? He stands there and he says, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. I feel like painting my face right now. <laughs> hey, hey, men, let me just say this to you. I don't want this message just to be another dumpster that just dumps on you more things that you need to do because you're not even doing the other things that you know you should be doing. I'm sharing this with you because I want to encourage you that you can find progression in these things. We're being conformed to the image of Christ. Ladies, kids, give... Give us men some time. Give us, encourage us where you see some growth. Encourage even small growth. Man, I, if, if you would just take a moment and you just look back at these three words, maybe you're out of balance on one of these three words. Maybe you have a wrong view of self that you forgot that you're formed and fashioned by God. You were created by God. Maybe you're totally out of balance and all you're doing is chasing a career instead of embracing a calling. So it's all about mighty dollar and the hours and you're sacrificing your family on the altar of success because you don't understand calling versus career. But guess what? Hey, you may be out of balance, but now there's an opportunity to find some balance. And then lastly, you say, oh man, I, I've caved, I've compromised. Okay, okay, you're out of balance. But now there's an opportunity. Opportunity to find balance. Because let me, let me explain this to you. When you look at those three and you go, man, I'm out of balance, I see that as an opportunity. You know why? Think this out with me, smart people. The only way you find balance is by being out of balance. Did you hear that? So what, 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 what God is giving to us men in this chapter is an opportunity to find balance and get our footing back. You have to be out of balance to find the balance, and you always have to be about finding balance. Case in point, remember when you learned to ride a bike? Remember, I remember I learned to ride a bike. My, my dad got me a bike. He, he put training wheels on it. Remember training wheels? Training wheels had a tremendous ministry in my life. And, 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 and I just remember I could ride everywhere and it never fell over. I was, always, I was always in balance. And then one day my dad came to me and said, son, we're going to take your training wheels off. I said, please don't. 
He says, no, it's, 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 it's time. You're going to take your training wheels off, but I'll fall down. He says, no, I, don't worry about it. When you start to feel out of balance, you're going to learn to balance yourself and to help you out. As your dad, as your father, I'm going to be behind you, and I'm going to hold the seat of your bike as you pedal and ride until you find that balance. So we go out there. He takes the training wheels off. We st- I start to get on the bike, and I'm a little fearful, but I start riding and start pedaling, and he says, you're doing it. And I'm thinking, this is great. I'm pedaling. I'm super excited. Here I am, 19, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just all of a sudden, I'm balanced. I'm balanced. Men, we love you. And the Father that fashioned you loves you. And he's got his hand on your life. And I'm telling you this week, let him and you find some balance in these three areas. Amen? Amen. Father, we are so grateful for your word to us. We are so grateful for the fact that you wrote everything down. We have a lot of big words for that, but Lord, I'm just thankful for how awesome you are that you thought ahead of time to write it all down because you knew we were going to need to go back to the directions many times. So on a very simple level, we just say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for taking the time to put it all, all down in writing to us. We live with hope that this week there's an opportunity for balance and progression in each of these areas this morning. Father, I pray that if this truth has met your will and your desire for each of us, each of us men this week, that by your Spirit, you will bring it to pass. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said,